All right. Uh, hi, I'm Alyssa from the University of Maryland, uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, how users learn security behaviors. So the title of our paper and our talk uh, is How I Learned to be Secure, a Census Representative Survey of Security Advice Sources and Behavior. Uh, and this is work I did with Sean Cross at Johns Hopkins University and Michelle Masaryk at the University of Maryland. Uh, so most of us can remember how we learned to ride a bicycle. Um, probably our parents taught us. And we didn't have to look very far for an authoritative source on bicycle behavior. Um, but when it comes to digital security, this is a little bit more challenging. Um, so users are constantly online, uh, and they're having to sort through a variety of different security information, alerts, prompts, novels worth of text, uh, in order to figure out which behaviors to practice and which to reject. Uh, when they make a wrong choice, they can have a negative experience. Uh, and this can lead to financial and emotional consequences that we'd like to prevent. So in order to figure out how to prevent these negative experiences, we want to understand how users are learning behaviors in the first place. Uh, so first, we under want to understand where they're getting their advice. Uh, and more specifically, who's learning how? Are there differences based on demographics or, or skills in where users are getting their advice? Uh, and then finally, what are their reasons for accepting and rejecting uh, different pieces of advice? So in order to answer these questions, we conducted an online survey uh, that we rigorously pre-tested, uh, and we wanted to ensure that it was census representative with a reasonably large sample size so that our findings could be generalized to the US population. So more specifically, what were we asking about? Uh, we started by asking about users' behaviors. And we were interested not only in digital security behaviors, but also physical security. Uh, so why we care about physical security? Well, physical security advice has been around for a bit longer than digital security. Uh, and we wanted to see if there are things we can learn from the physical domain that we could bring into digital security. Uh, so more specifically, we asked questions about uh, passwords behavior, antivirus behavior, updating behavior, and use of two-factor authentication as far as digital security. Uh, and for physical security, we asked about personal safety while walking alone at night uh, as sort of our representative behavior. And largely, we were interested in these behaviors in order to figure out where users were learning them. Um, so for example, we asked users, where did you learn about making strong passwords? Uh, and to provide answer choices, we drew on our qualitative work that appeared at Oakland earlier this year, uh, as well as prior work in the literature. Uh, so answer choices that they were offered were the media, uh, the workplace, school, family and friends, as well as having heard about other people's negative experiences or having one themselves. Uh, also service providers like Time Warner or Bank of America. Uh, and finally, whether um, their device or the website prompted or required them to use a particular behavior. Uh, and beyond this sort of general set of uh, answer choices, we dug a little deeper. So if they said that they you know, took workplace security advice, we'd asked if that was from an IT colleague, from a non-IT colleague, from a newsletter, and so on. Uh, and finally, even if they reported not using a behavior, we still asked them what advice they'd seen about it and why they decided not to take it. Um, so in addition to all these questions about advice sources, uh, like I said, we are interested in who's taking what advice. Uh, so we asked demographic questions. So in addition to standard demographic questions, we also uh, asked questions about security sensitivity. So whether they held a security clearance uh, currently or in the past, as well as whether they handled government regulated data like HIPAA or FERPA data. We also used the Hagarty Web Use Skills Index to measure their internet skill level. Uh, and finally, we wanted to understand whether they had a background or job in CS or IT to assess whether they had technological expertise. Uh, so after we developed all these questions, we wanted to make sure they were actually measuring the constructs we wanted to measure. Uh, and so in order to check this, we used cognitive interviews as well as expert reviews. Uh, and we invited a diverse sample of people to come and test our survey, as well as asking survey methodology and HCI experts to ensure we were following best practices. Uh, once we finished iterating on our survey, uh, we deployed it using an online web panel uh, through Survey Sampling International and collected 526 resp responses. Uh, here you can see a comparison um, on each of the demographic categories between our sample and the census. And as you can see, it's nearly census representative, uh, with our sample being 
just a little bit wealthier uh, than the general population. So based on this, we think that uh, we can draw reasonable, reasonably general conclusions about advice behavior in the US. So what did we actually find? Uh, first, where are people getting their advice? The first thing that popped out at us was that people are taking a lot, of advice, a lot of advice from prompts. And we know that prompts are important for point behaviors, like not passing through certificate warnings. Uh, but this is sort of one of the first times we're seeing that prompts are providing more general security education. So people are learning something they, taking something they learned from a point behavior and applying it more broadly. Uh, and this was true in about 80% of our participants. So in addition to kind of device-based prompts, we are also seeing human advice sources. Uh, so family and friends were the most prevalent one, uh, but this was fairly closely followed by service providers, which we were surprised to see. Uh, so it looks like Bank of America and Verizon are providing more advice than we would expect. Uh, followed by that, there's workplace advice as well as people are learning from negative experiences, uh, which prior work has also shown. So beyond um, where people are getting advice, we were more interested in who was taking what advice. Uh, and so to or in order to answer this question, we constructed a set of logistic regression models. Uh, and these were binary models where our outcome variable was the probability that you were going to take advice from one of these sources. Uh, so for example, the probability that you're going to have said you took advice from, from the media uh, based on your demographics as well as uh, your internet skill level, whether you're data sensitive, your technological background, uh, and also your beliefs. So we asked questions about uh, how you weighted the importance and trustworthiness of digital security advice versus physical security advice. So we fed all of these factors into our models to figure out who was taking what advice. What we ended up finding was a kind of digital divide in advice taking. So those people who had higher internet skills and who were using more, uh, who had more sensitive data experience, uh, who also tended to be higher income, were more likely to take advice from their workplaces, from service providers, from the media, uh, and to be able to learn from negative experiences. And we somewhat consider these advice sources to be the more authoritative ones, um, especially the workplace and service providers. So on the other side of this gap, uh, those who had lower internet skill, uh, hadn't worked with sensitive data, and tended to be lower income, uh, were more likely to take advice from prompts and from family and friends. And so this kind of re-underscores uh, the importance of these prompts for general security learning and not just point behaviors. Uh, and it also begs the question of why this is happening. Um, so some of our hypotheses are that uh, lower skill or potentially lower income workers are not having the opportunity to get workplace training uh, or the information provided in the workplace or in the media might be at the wrong level for their internet skill. Uh, and so as a specific example, we see for media um, that those with higher internet skill are about 1.3 times more likely to have taken media advice. Uh, so we see in this graph the number of respondents versus their internet skill level uh, and many more respondents above an internet skill of three are taking media advice than when they're below. And in general, this holds true. So those with higher internet skill are 1.2 to 1.4 times more likely to take advice from media, workplace, service providers, and negative experiences. Uh, and those who handle sensitive data, so either HIPAA or FERPA or security claims, are two to four times more likely. Uh, so there's certainly some type of divide going on here. All right, so beyond this divide, um, why are people in general accepting and rejecting advice? Uh, as far as advice acceptance, uh, we drew on our prior work as well as our pretesting to come up with a list of reasons why people are accepting advice. Uh, the two that stood out from prior work were either trusting the source of the advice, so my dad's a security expert, I trust my dad, so I'm just going to take his advice. I didn't really think about it, I'm just taking it. Uh, and the other is, oh, I thought about this advice and you know, I have a big scary dog, so the police told me to lock my door, but I don't need to. Uh, and then finally, another uh, reason that came up in our cognitive interviews was fear of a negative experience. Your advice made me scared, so now I'm going to take it. Uh, it turned out that for digital security, people reported taking advice because they were scared of a negative experience uh, less than 10% of the time. Uh, so that's sort of an interesting point in terms of fear-mongering or trying to inspire fear that that may not be so effective. 
Uh, and so here I just show uh, the results for trust of advice source and content. Uh, and so what we found is that users are reporting, evaluating the content of advice about physical security and also about passwords. And so we hypothesized that this is probably the case um, because A, physical security is very ubiquitous and also fairly tangible. Uh, one of our prior participants said, if you come at me with a gun, I know I should be worried. Um, and password security is probably one of the most ubiquitous um, pieces of advice that we have out there. And so that might be a reason it resembles physical security. Uh, and this group was statistically significantly different than the rest of the advice cases. So on the other hand, um, for updating and antivirus security, uh, these tended to be taken because users trusted the source. So again, this is the, my dad said so, uh, reasoning. And this could possibly be because this advice is hard to understand, or maybe it's just not as prevalent yet. Uh, and then finally, two-factor landed kind of right in the middle. So it was different than both of the groups I talked about before, uh, but not quite in with physical security and passwords. Uh, and we hypothesized this might be because it's sort of like passwords in that it's authentication, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated, so it might be harder for people to evaluate. And so in general, we want to start to think about how we push um, newer behaviors and other behaviors toward allowing people to actually evaluate the advice themselves and have uh, more autonomy in their choices. Okay, so why are people rejecting advice? Maybe, okay. Um, so the first reason probably doesn't surprise anyone that much. It's inconvenient. These behaviors are sort of annoying to implement and users don't wanna do them. Uh, the second one might be a little bit more surprising. Uh, there's too much marketing material. So a number of our respondents were reporting that advice that contained marketing made them not wanna take it at all. Uh, and then finally, lacking a negative experience. So prior work has said, okay, having negative experiences is a really powerful teacher. Uh, but so far, no one said not having negative experiences might make you not do things. Um, and so this is sort of interesting in that we want to both teach people, but maybe not by having negative experiences and prevent them from not doing things, also not by giving them negative experiences. Uh, so we'll get back to that later. So more specifically by behavior, uh, we see that for antivirus software, uh, people are usually rejecting it either because they think it's inevitable, I'm just gonna get a virus, so don't bother, uh, because they didn't understand why they needed to use it, uh, because they're careful on the internet uh, because they've never had a negative experience or overwhelmingly because there was too much marketing. Uh, so many of us probably remember aggressive antivirus marketing campaigns and that the software at least used to be typically uh, for profit. Uh, so it looks like that's still holding true at least in participants' memories even if it's changed a little bit recently. Uh, and then for two-factor, we see sort of a different set of primary reasons. Um, so the first one here is privacy threat. And to talk a little bit more about this, um, our prior qualitative work saw this slight trend in that people said, I don't wanna give my phone number to Google. I don't know what they're doing with it. Uh, and I'm not really sure what security I'm gonna get from it, so like it's not worth it. Uh, and we're seeing that's at least fairly prominent for two-factor authentication. Um, so that might be a design consideration with these types of things in the future um, to help reassure respondents about how their uh, personal information is being used. Uh, next, we had that people were reporting they felt their data had no value, so there was no reason to protect it. Uh, again, that they had not had a negative experience, uh, and then rather largely inconvenience. Um, so there have been a lot of strides made for making two-factor more convenient, uh, but it looks like it's still a concern. Uh, and then finally, if we look at the light blue bars in the chart, they're mostly smaller than the other bars. Uh, so updating advice and updating behavior seems to be doing the best out of all of these, uh, and it's being rejected mostly because it's inconvenient, but not too much when we compare it. All right, so what does that mean for those of you who are security systems or tools developers? Uh, so first, like I said, and I'll say it again, um, prompts seem to matter, and not just for point behaviors. Uh, so it's important to kind of think about what your information you're imparting in the prompts and whether perhaps it can be changed to be slightly more general. Uh, and then also that this is especially true for lower skilled, uh, potentially lower income users. Um, and so it's important to think about the readability level uh, as well as the types of 
technical terms that are being used and whether it's immediately implementable for them. Um, so the second thing is this authentication. So like I just mentioned, two-factor was being rejected both for inconvenience and for privacy concerns. Uh, so it may be important when designing both two-factor and new types of authentication tools to consider how to mitigate these privacy concerns and of course how to continue improving convenience. Uh, and then finally, if you want to get people to use your tools, uh, what we keep seeing in our work is that you need to provide them with tangible and concrete information. Uh, so they're more likely to use them if they can evaluate the content of the advice themselves. Uh, and the more tangible and concrete and easy to understand you make it, the more likely they can make those evaluations and then go and use the tool. Now, in the case that we haven't quite gotten there, uh, they're relying on trust of source. So it's important to indicate who the tool is coming from, whether they're a trustworthy person. Um, if someone's giving advice about it, make sure they seem trustworthy. Uh, and this is something that we're going to look into further in the future uh, is what actually makes something trustworthy and also what triggers that marketing reaction on the other side. Okay, and then if you're a usability researcher or interested in usability, uh, like I said, we highlight kind of two new reasons for rejecting advice beyond inconvenience, which is marketing and this lack of negative experience. Uh, and the lack of negative experience is especially interesting because we should start thinking about how we can simulate these. So instead of forcing people to have negative experiences in order to learn, uh, how can we help them have the same learning power but without the consequences? Uh, similarly, we provide like a validated list um, of advice sources uh, that we tested in qualitative work and also evaluated um, by doing our cognitive interviews. So we think these are reasonably exhaustive. Uh, and similarly, for advice source rejection and acceptance, um, the reasons that we've provided are reasonably well validated. So these could be used in future work. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, we found the first evidence of an advice divide in security. Uh, and this looks like something that we need to try to bridge and understand better uh, in order to prevent uh, some people from having less, less access to digital security than others. So in summary, uh, we wanted to find out where people were getting advice, uh, who was taking which advice, and why they were accepting and rejecting it. In order to answer these questions, we conducted a census representative web survey uh, that we rigorously pre-tested. And what we found, as I just said, is this evidence of a digital advice divide uh, that we need to look into further as well as finding that users uh, are accepting advice about passwords and physical security by evaluating the content uh, and accepting advice about updating an antivirus based on their trust of the source. Uh, and finally, we saw that advice was getting rejected for inconvenience as well as too much marketing and a lack of negative experience, which invites us to figure out how we can mitigate these rejection reasons uh, so we can give our users less excuses for not using our tools. And that's it. For me. If you have questions for our speaker, we have two microphones. Please come up to the microphone. All right. Uh, make sure to give your name and affiliation. Hi, Chris Kanish, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. This is really, really great, <coughs> excuse me, uh, interesting work. The, the first question I had definitely is, that to me, I'm, I imagine that it's hard to remember exactly where I got a certain type of security advice. Were you able to devise a methodology to evaluate how accurately people were recollecting where they got that advice? Yeah, so this is a hard thing that we struggled with a lot. Um, so a lot of what we did was in these cognitive interviews, people came in and we asked them to think aloud as they answered every question. Um, and what we eventually figured out was like, first we were like, where did you hear about this? They're like, I don't know. But when we went back and said, where did you first learn about XYZ? They're like, oh, I remember. So for some reason, the where did you first learn seemed to trigger it. Um, and in the first iteration, we offered like an other thing. And we actually didn't have very many people being like, I don't know, um, which sort of surprised us. So it seems like, at least for some of these behaviors, they were somewhat memorable. Um, the other thing I'll say is that younger people seem to have a harder time remembering than older people. Um, and because our sample was census representative, we actually weren't skewed toward younger people. So I think it sort of balanced out. Yeah. Uh, before we get to the next question, can I have the second speaker come talk to our AV person? 
Okay. Okay. We'll go back and forth. Hi, Ian Goldberg, University of Waterloo. Thanks for the great talk. So one of your, one of your takeaways is that users evaluate the content of these kinds of things, but rely on trusted sources for these kinds of things. Um, can you give, like if I had a new thing, how would you predict which bucket it would fall in? Um, so my prediction would be that it would fall in the source bucket um, because when we did the qualitative work, anything that was sort of new and uncomfortable and potentially hard to understand, but even not that hard to understand, they were like, I'll just trust my person and do what they say. Um, so I'd predict source, but I think um, if you're able to make analogies to physical security um, or even have like pictures or something exciting, then you might be able to push it toward the other side. Hi, Greg Shannon, off, uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So you know there's a uh, uh, effort to improve two-factor authentication use, so your, your comments about uh, low income and low knowledge is, are helpful. Have you seen, um, what have you seen as the especially effective uh, mechanisms, especially like from, say, Google or uh, Apple or whoever, in terms of their encouragements to uh, uh, get users to understand and I guess related to that, have you, have you ever uh, considered looking at the mechanism uh, explanations underlying two-factor in, in terms of uh, how much do people need to understand the extent to which, you know, what two-factor is really doing and why it might really help make a difference and then to be able to simulate um, the negative consequences if they didn't have that protection? Yeah, um, so a couple of things on that. So in the paper, we actually, uh, and in the survey, we asked people why or like what they thought the purpose was of these different behaviors. Um, and we we're actually pretty surprised to find that they were, the majority of them were right about two-factor authentication. So they knew what it was doing, um, but they were still not wanting to use it because of this privacy or inconvenience. So that actually surprised me because I thought like, oh, they must not know that it's useful. Uh, so I think as far as like what Google or Apple or Facebook are doing right or wrong, um, uh, some of them I'll see actually literally say like we will use your phone number to also do X, Y, Z. Um, so I would recommend not doing that because uh, I think that like immediately raises hairs. Um, and I think what might be helpful is actually adding an explicit statement that's like we're not going to use your phone number or you can do these other things if you don't want to give us your phone number. Um, but we are very interested in looking at like different descriptions and seeing how users react to them, and that's something we want to do in the future. Yeah, or someone else will do in the future. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, Bill Young from uh, Brightside. So, um, because I think your survey is mainly uh, on the individual base, right? So, because also um, like yesterday we hear I hear a uh, talk from uh, so the like uh, industry like uh, automotive industry or uh, IoT industry they also have they also should exercise a lot of uh, let's say security awareness, but it seems they are not doing that. So I'm just curious, like, is, do you also? A plan to like extend your uh, research why they are not doing these type of things which is also very important in securing the whole picture. Yeah, um, so thus far we've focused on home behavior um, and there's been a little bit of work into industry behavior. Um, but I think there needs to be more and definitely down the line, yes. Uh, right now, still kind of looking at this marginalized home user base, but yes, definitely. Hi, Sergey from Stanford. Did you have any measure of the quality of the advice? That is, did you see like people getting information from some sources, actually bad advice or good advice? And did you see any correlation between sources and quality of advice? Yeah, uh, so no, the only, so, okay. So we could sort of look at that in terms of like, do you practice the behavior and where did you get the advice? But that's, you know, like a, tenuous connection there, so not really. That's something we want to do in the future, uh, but to be honest, measuring the quality of advice is something that we're still trying to work on, so if people have ideas on how you would do that, that would be great, but we were not able to do that. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I have a question before we stop. Sure. Uh, I was very curious on the slide that talked about the where people learned information from. What hurt me the most was school was the lowest one. <sighs> Yeah. Right. So is, it, is that reflective of the study and maybe because you mentioned education wasn't, you know, is more census representative? Uh, and what can we do as educators to fix that, right? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Um, so I will say for school, 
um, <laughs> there's actually a hilarious relationship. So unsurprisingly, younger people more likely to report getting this information from school, probably because the internet didn't exist for a lot of people. But the strange relationship was for people who had a background or worked in CSIT, they were like way less likely to have gotten advice from school, um, which I could hypothesize is because they think they already know it or maybe they already learned it somewhere else or something like this. Um, but I think some of it is maybe bringing it in earlier. Um, so like before college teaching people about this, um, which is probably especially important for privacy uh, information. So cool. yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Okay, so this is the, ah, the second speaker. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. All right. Well, wait, let me introduce you first. I, they got to get set up in the back, too, so I'm slightly delaying. Um, great. So our next speaker is, apologies in advance, uh, Vladimir Kl